And it is my honor this evening to introduce to you Mecca Jamila Sullivan, Assistant Professor of English at Bryn Mawr College and author of the short story collection, Blue Talk and Love. One of the things I find to be most exhilarating about Sullivan's fiction is the way that she writes about bodies and physical lived experiences. As one reviewer said, Sullivan explores questions of difference and identity in their many forms, particularly through language and the body. Of foremost importance are the ways in which Sullivan's protagonists take up space. Embodying sizes, shapes, and colors outside of society's boundaries of normal, Sullivan's characters must make space for themselves in the world. Sullivan writes primarily of black girls and women who love words and use them in the creation and protection of their physical and psychical spaces. The stories in Blue Talk and Love center on black and brown girls and women with, to quote from her Lambda Literary Review, wrong bodies, big bodies, fat bodies, queer bodies, disabled bodies, hungry, unruly bodies, who take up space and desire nonetheless. An award-winning writer and playwright and a scholar of gender, sexuality, and literature, Sullivan constructs her characters' embodied lives with tender detail, attuned to the various ways in which their voices and desires both exceed and are constrained by their corporalities. Mecca Jamila Sullivan was the winner of the 2018 Judith A. Markowitz Award for LGBTQ Writers. Her scholarship and creative writing have appeared in Kalalu, American Literary History, GLQ, American Quarterly, American Short Fiction, Palimpsest, Best New Writing, Ms. Magazine, The Feminist Wire, Prairie Schooner, and others. <laughs> and have re received report from the Mellon Foundation, Yaddo, the Breadloaf Writers Conference, Social Sciences Research Council, the American Association and the American Association of University Women, Duke University, and the NEA. Her forthcoming scholarly project, The Poetics of Difference, Queer Feminist Forms in the African Diaspora, explores the politics of experiment in black queer feminist literary cultures. She's also completing a novel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Misha, for that very thoughtful introduction. Sorry for the list-like quality in my bio. I will work on that. I know. I should just like chill out. You know? um, so it's so great to be here. It's also wonderful to see so many folks having stuck around for this reading. I am really grateful to Sarah Rogers, uh, Jasmine Cobb, Ranjana Khanna, Janetta Candelario, um, and everyone else whose work sort of brought us here today. I am honored to be here in such stellar company with so many feminist writers and thinkers I admire, and to have the chance to read with Cece Jaji, who I have loved and admired for a long time. Um, so just a quick kind of content note. I'm going to talk a little bit about sexual violence, um, and then we'll also be talking about stories. And so I love that there's been the kind of a theme reflecting on stories from Dr. Giddings' remarks about sort of the history versus the story, the question of who gets to write and tell our stories, Miriam Chancey's reflection on the stories of market women um, and the kind of ways in which diasporic knowledges help us understand and read diasporic women's stories more effectively and more fully. I'm thinking about Alexis's oracle exercise this morning, which sort of led us in a collaborative storytelling um, enterprise that then could sort of reflect on our own stories, the questions we have about our lives. And for me, I think Meridians is the perfect space. It's not a coincidence that, that this is the space where we're reflecting on stories in all of these different ways. Meridians, for me, I think, has served as a space to tell our stories, to learn how to hear and read our stories, um, and to sort of interact and, and converse, have that kind of collaborative moment. So again, there are references to sexual violence. There are also reflections on this power of storytelling and feminist storytelling in particular. I stood up for myself. I protected my own life. It makes me feel like I don't have any right or any control to protect myself. It's going to be a good ending to my story. It's not going to have me behind bars forever. That's not how my story will end. This is the voice of Renata Hill, one of the New Jersey Four, a group of black lesbian friends, all teens and young women, convicted with the attempted murder of a man who assaulted and threatened to rape them in a homophobic attack in 2006. 
These women, these four women, Patrice Johnson, Renata Hill, Vernice Brown, Terrain Dandridge, are popularly known as the New Jersey Four. They were charged with the felony gang assault and attempted murder of Dwayne Buckle, who, again, threatened uh, to rape them and verbally assaulted them in New York's Greenwich Village on the pier, the sort of once queer space of the Christopher Street Pier. And they'd come from their homes in New Jersey to socialize one evening in the summer. The women, all under the age of 24, received sentences ranging from six months probation to 11 years in prison. It was never proven that one of them had stabbed Buckle. We'll return to Renata and the New Jersey Four story in a second, but first I want to linger on her voice. I stood up for myself. I protected my own life. It makes me feel like I don't have any right or control to protect myself. It's going to be a good ending to my story. That's not how my story will end. Speaking from behind an unjust prison sentence, Hill claims her right to create her own story, to author the narrative of her life. She does what so many women of color and queer people, and especially queer women of color, do on the daily as a means of survival. She speaks her life story into existence. Her defiant claim, it's going to be a good ending to my story, that's not how my story will end, is a radical act of voicing that many of us know well. She uses her voice to imagine her life into being. This is the vision of Meridians, stated in clear and moving prose from day one, that is, volume one, issue one, in the fall 2000 forward by Ruth Simmons, then president of Smith College. Quote, in creating Meridians, we sought to establish a venue where women of color and those interested in their histories and cultures could, to, could participate in shaping the base of knowledge for future students and scholars desiring to be well-educated about the world they live in and the societies with which they interact. This journal posits that women of color and their concerns need to be, and in fact will be, at the center of the Academy's scholarly research agenda in the coming years. This vision comes into color for me, as both an artist and a scholar, in the introductory description of the cultural works section from that same inaugural volume, in which the incredible group of contributing editors states, quote, women of color have chosen creative expression as a means of doing theory. We do not wish to reinscribe a boundary between the political and the aesthetic, or the theoretical and the expressive. Rather, Meridians underscores that any artistic choice implies a political choice, and that women writing from a marginal position are more apt to recognize the political implications of their art. This, of course, brings to mind Miriam's discussion as well of sort of the multi-voiceness, the multi-vocality of black women's theorizing in the diaspora. The artist scholar in me wants to say, amen, ashe, you know, show enough, true that, all these things. As an undergrad at Smith College that semester, the fall 2000, I remember the buzz about Meridians and about culture works in particular. Aaliyah's song, Try Again, was on the charts, as was Jay-Z's Big Pimpin' featuring UGK, which introduced me and my New York crew to both the wondrous rhythms of Southern rap and the urgent ambivalence of hip-hop feminist critique. I was a big, black, queer 19-year-old sophomore and a literature head enrolled in Jeanette Candelario's Intro to Sociology course, where I and my homies learned that the politics of our hair, our conversations, our bodies, and our loving were matters of intellectual and political importance. In other words, it was there at Smith, while Meridians was brewing, that we learned to value the textures of our voice and our stories. And that's no coincidence. As these founding visions of Meridians suggest, Writing for women of color has always been about radical imaginings of voice, inserting our voices into conversations that don't leave room for them, using our imaginations to speak down the violences that threaten to undo us and speak new possibilities into existence. Foundational artist scholars June Jordan, Audre Lorde, Gloria Ansaldua, Entezaki Shange, Toni Morrison, Leslie Marmon Silko, and the many Meridians contributors who have continued their legacies all do that work showing us the politics and poetics of radical creative voicing. And as we know, being attuned to the politics and poetics of voicing, especially the voicing of queer and feminist stories, is particularly necessary in our current moment. New modes of voicing and ways of reading have us reeling in the constant immediacy of digital shock. 
Stories of difference and its cost swirl around us incessantly. Images of state-sanctioned violence greet us without warning as we scroll our various screen feeds numbly. Baffling narratives of injustice unfold before us in real time while we drink our morning coffee. But in this digital moment, media also might bring us new modes of voicing. We can see the spread of language almost literally. We can watch a single woman's voice catch fire in the digital space, become public outcry, public critique, and a movement. I'm here talking about Tarana Burke, the black woman founder of the Me Too movement, whose 10 plus years working on the movement was silenced when Me Too met the mainstream in 2017. We can see her voice taken from her, the labor of her story attributed to someone else. And we can tune our own voices in critique, to complain, to shout out her name, to call her up from the margins until at least some people hear us and check themselves. And of course, there are also all the creative interrupted things, interruptive things our students are doing on TikTok, for example, which I cannot claim to fully understand, but admire nonetheless. Part of the power of Black Lives Matter, Me Too, Stop Trans Murders, Cite Black Women, Black Girl Magic, Girls Like Us, these hashtags all sort of tag phrases that also become organizing tools. They function almost as speech acts, making claims to community, shared vision and consciousness, but also enabling collective action through collective storytelling. As hashtags, they help facilitate, literally, linking us against our silencing. But they also serve as reminders of the link between state violence and linguistic violence. That is how not only brute force, civic injustice, but also systemic silencing pose threats against our lives. I stood up for myself. I protected my life. It's gonna be a good ending to my story. It's not gonna have me behind bars forever. That's not how my story will end. So I wrote a story called Wolfpack for the New Jersey Four because I felt that I needed to access that voicing that fiction makes possible to put together the pieces of the story that were not being told. The other version of that story is that I wrote the story because I was taking, a, I was actually TAing for a class on queer politics and we were talking about the Stonewall uprising and there was a moment in um, the discussion where we were looking at news coverage of the Stonewall uprisings and a student sort of made the observation that the uprising, the, the, the trans people who were protesting were being referred to in sort of dehumanizing terms, particularly being called killer bees. And the professor who I you know, admire deeply said, oh, that would never happen in this moment. And I had just encountered an article and was turned to be several articles about this incident in Greenwich Village in 2006 that referred to these women using several similar terms, including wolf pack. And so this was the other sort of impetus to kind of explore the, the place of linguistic violence in storytelling through fiction. The New York Daily News referred to these women repeatedly as a lesbian wolf pack in multiple articles. But also, there were also other sort of moments of linguistic violence and languages of dehumanization that permeated the case. Buckle, for example, referred to one of the women, a larger woman, as an elephant just before the attack. He also then exclaims that one of the women, quote, looks like a man before threatening to, quote, fuck them straight. The judge reprimands the women with the adage, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, before delivering, in words, the sentences that will literally rend the fabric of their lives apart for years. There is a kind of narrative violence at play here, the story being told and reinforced is that these black women's lives don't matter because they are not human lives. The story is that black women's bodies are disposable bodies available for use, condemnation, management, and social definition by others. They are bodies that cannot tell their own stories, and if they do, no one should listen. I stood up for myself. I protected my own life. It's, not going, it's going to be a good end to my story, it's not gonna have me behind bars forever. That's not how my story will end. So I'm gonna read um, two short sort of moments from this story. The story is, is told from three different points of view. I'm gonna read two of them. Um, but I, I wanna sort of preface this by saying that there was in fact a better end to the story and we'll talk a little bit 
as I finish about sort of how the role of feminist interventions through storytelling actually sort of help intervene and medi mediate the, the outcome of this, this story in particular. So this first section is from a character's point of view named Tehran. We left the pier that night with our faces tied tight into smiles, me and my girl in the front. Aria was laughing, her hand all warm and wet in mine. Vernice and Luna were behind us, quiet as usual, cuddled up in each other like West Forth was their living room. Shah's little friends were holding down the rear, and Shah was on the near side of the curb, brows sharp as switchblades, face in full glow like she was a drag queen walking for femme realness. Before shit went down, the night was nice, cool, everything peace. Then I saw it happen in sepia tone, time winding down to slow motion. I knew shit was wrong before the dude threw his cigarette at us, before he touched Arya's neck, before he slung his threats at Shah. As soon as he called Vernice what he did, I knew there would be a fight. Me and Arya had had some problems in the car, but she had brought it down to a simmer by the time we got to 6th Ave. She was finishing up the summer session at Morton Street Middle School, and someone had asked her to make a list of the students that should be kept apart in the future just so that a gun or a baby didn't show up in class one day. I told her I didn't think it was her place, that by the time they're, they're 12, kids should be allowed to conduct their little romances and tragedies as they please. She shot me an icicle stare and told me I was naive. You can't pretend the teacher's role is strictly intellectual in 2006. Things are not that simple for us, Tehran. Full first name, I knew she was tight. I told her I knew she wasn't simple, that I liked how complicated she was. She told me complex and started popping some shit about transitive verbs. Mm -hmm. I put my arm around her, said I didn't know the difference, but was willing to learn. She liked that. By the time we walked past the International Film Center, we were back to our black dyke hood love, like and set it off, all Cleo and Ursula again. We walked past the newsstand where some skaters and rich kids and a handful of gay boys were sprinkled around, all talking kiki and enjoying the night. Merengue horns and hip hop beats hovered over the pavement and the smells of beer, smoke and McDonald's french fries mixed thick on the street. In front of the sex shop on West 3rd, a homeless woman was sitting on the ground talking to her scarf. When we passed the woman, Shah's little rich girl friend stared like she saw an alien, then stepped over the woman like she wasn't there at all. I whispered in my lady's ear, Aria, what do you think would happen if we took her up to Harlem or brought her back to Newark with us? Aria laughed. She'd probably just front like she wasn't scared, just like she'd been fronting all night, trying to be smooth. I laughed too. I don't know, maybe it's not a front. Maybe there is some smoothness to her after all, deep, deep down. Aria slapped my finger and shot me a look that made me wish we'd stayed in bed that night. Then I saw him, half a second before he saw us. He looked about 35, although I found out later that he was in his 20s. And from the table he had set up on the pavement covered with DVDs, I would have swore he was a bootlegger, although the papers, the prosecutor, and everyone else who mattered called him a filmmaker from the next day on. When he opened his mouth at Shah, I didn't care what he called himself. Hey, princess, he said. Shah didn't respond. He didn't give up. Sweetheart, I'm talking to you. She's not interested, I told him from the far side of the pavement. Why don't you let her speak for herself? He moved from behind the table, took a pull from his cigarette, stretching his neck to see where my voice came from. She doesn't have anything to say to you, I said, loud now getting hot. She's gay. Then he looked dead at Vernice, thinking she was the one talking instead of me. Who asked you what you think, you goddamn elephant? Vernice was shocked, frozen, like if someone had snuck up on her and flashed a camera in her face. Fuck you, nigga, I shouted. Oh, that was you, he said, taking another pull and finally turning my way. You look like a fucking man. What, you sticking up for your woman? Don't go that way, sweetheart. He looked at Shah and grabbed his fly. I'll fuck you straight. I shouted something. I can't remember what. The words and the spit and my teeth all mixed in my mouth. He flicked his cigarette at us, the cherry arching across the space toward Angelique and Margina, who looked like they would piss themselves soon if they hadn't already. We were in motion before the fire landed. I can't really call what happened after that. Wild how time and space make perfect sense up to a point, then unravel like shoelace threads in the tick of a second. I saw his hand on Shah's neck in her hair. I felt my fist pushing hard into his shoulder, the blows never landing heavy enough. I saw Angelique and Margina get some hits too, felt my surprise. I heard some words come from behind me, from Vernice maybe, but I have no idea what they were. I never saw a knife, and I never heard the motherfucker cry. 
I wish I had. Aria is the only one who hears me when I say I saw it coming from that one word, elephant, before the spit and the fire and the bodies flew. Everything after that was like dominoes falling into place on a track. Tell my femme friend you want her, fine. Call me a man, whatever. None of that is new. But what he had for Vernice was something different. She didn't even get to be human. He tore the person out of her, like he tore that clump out of Shah's hair, like the judge tore up our lives and everything we know, chunks of us missing like truth missing from news stories. The cops, reporters, lawyer, jury, everyone but my woman skips over that part, that word, elephant, like they want to press fast forward and get to the real story. When the first report came out without mentioning what he called Vernice, Arya said it was because the white reporter dude didn't see why that kind of dehumanization would mean a fight to us. I realized then that Arya is the naive one. I tried to let that word sit in my ears for a long time after she said it, dehumanization. By then, I knew I wouldn't get to hear her talk like how she does for a long time. That was our goodbye. I can't speak for the rest of us, but I was glad when he took that step and put his hands on Shah. Hands you can see, touch, prove. Hands you can bite and burn and tear away. But words I'm learning ain't shit. Shah doesn't know if she stabbed the man. They screamed the question into her skull for hours, and each time she said, I'm not sure. But I know this. I wish I'd had a knife in my hand. Wish I'd heard him shriek like a dying cat under my fingers. I can see that night however I want to see it now, and I see it this way all the time. I'm the one with the knife, and I am sure. This woman sticks it in him real fucking good. So this next section I'm going to read is from the perspective of a different character named Lashanya. The knife was a gift from my mother. She gave it to me to keep in my purse because she loves me, because she doesn't want me to leave this world before she does. They were killing black dykes in Newark, like they always are, all over. But now there was Sakia's gun, Sakia Gunn, my cousin's sister's friend. Sakia with the deep eyes and the sweet, shy smile. Sakia, who was 15 and could have been me, stabbed to death on the same corner where I catch the bus to work, right by the 24-hour police booth and still nobody saw. But Walmart doesn't give time off for hate crimes, and I had to work late all the same. My mother called that knife my bodyguard. She gave it to me to keep me safe, to keep me coming home. When I think of that night, I think in lists of things. I think of the smell of my hair grease melting under the street lights. I think of my newest sisters, Angelique and Margina, wailing behind me as the fire flies at my face. I think of the man, the stripes on his shirt getting bigger and bigger until they are on me, right on top. I do not see my knife. I try hard, plunge my fingers into memory, I try to see myself pulling the blade from my bag, try to feel what I have never felt before, my knife slipping past skin, sinking quick slow into flesh. But all I can remember is the weight of his hands on my scalp, those stripes falling on top of me like how this judge sits on top of the room, hovering like Jesus hovers in holographic paintings on project walls. Judge McBain sitting on top of me, his face breaking like a cloud, his cackle crashing over me like lightning. Sticks and stones may break my bones. That's what we should have thought, he says. That was the command that should have traveled like blood from our heads to our bodies. Not duck, not block. Protect yourself, your girl. As though I'll fuck you straight was just a pack of words. The man has a name, but I'd rather not say it. He's sitting up in the wooden box, just like how he, he sat up in some reporter's face, saying he didn't think it was a crime to, quote, say hello to a human being. I've never felt more alone before, more confused than in this moment. I feel like this man and Judge Dick Brain, that's what I want to call him, where they've got me to now. I feel like the two of them come from the same place, some place where a bootlegger without a pot to piss in and a white man with power dusting his shoulders like dandruff can be two sides of the same damn coin. This is not a place I ever thought I'd be. I did not know I lived there. But Dick Brain is the bootlegger's parrot in his sentencing speech. Sticks and stones, he says first, and then words don't justify hurting a human being. I sit and remember stripes and sounds and hands flying into me like arrows, wonder if either of them knows how good human being sounds right now as a thing to be. Sounds like a safe place in the flow of words and things something as sure as the ticking of a clock at the back of an old wooden room. I wonder if either of them will ever know how hard it is to think human, 
to be human when someone is threatening to knock, force, fuck the you out of you. I hear our names hit like tennis balls across the room and I think they may not know this, but we are women whose names mean things. Luna is bright and distant like the moon she is named for. Vernice is named for her mother who is more like her than either of them can admit. Aria is named for a beautiful kind of song. Angelique is named for an angel that welcomed her mother to heaven in a dream. Margina is named for her father's hope of getting the center of things to meet him on the sidelines. Tehran is named for a grandmother who spat in a white man's face for calling her girl, and an aunt who raised seven other people's children on the salary of a maid. My name is from Hopi and Spanish and Newark ghetto, my mother's imagination, and a mix of things. I wonder if Judge Dick Brain would have anything to say about that. But when the thunder quiets and the cloud seals up, what he has to say becomes clear. He forgets about names and drops numbers on us all. Angelique Ramos, Margina Thompson, Aria Lewis, six months probation. Luna Martinez, three years in prison. Tehran Daniels, five years. Vernice Smith, eight years. Lashanya Parrish, 11. I will be 19 tomorrow. The next time I'm able to run through a sprinkler on my mother's street, kiss my girlfriend in a quiet room, make myself a turkey sandwich, sing or dance with no one watching, I will be 30. I will never remember a bloody knife in my hand. No one will ever have to prove it was there. When we left Renice's house that night, her mother was on her way to church. While they got the baby dressed, Mrs. Smith asked Renice over and over to come with her to mass. Renice said no, sweetly, then strapped on a baby sandal, pulled up a tiny sock. Her mother asked one more time on her way out the door, and Renice said no thank you, like she was turning down butter for her toast. Mrs. Smith held the baby and said to all of us, all right then, you girls be safe. We were seven girls to her. Seven women to us. Either way, we were people, sure as time. So that's where the story ends. Um, and it's in the short story collection um, that Misha mentioned, Blue Talk and Love. But I wanted to add, which is outside, in case you want to get a copy. But um, more importantly, I wanted to add that, so interestingly, in 2008, after, you know, through the labor of a lot of organizing and activism, and especially the labor by feminist lawyers and black queer feminist lawyers in particular involved with the Innocence Project, um, the four women who were given prison sentences had their sentences commuted. And um, so the Federal District Appellate Court in New York heard the appeals of these women and each received sentence reductions after time served. The most substantial reduction was then 18-year-old Patrice Johnson, who was given the longest sentence, um, and her sentence was reduced from 11 years to eight years. So she was the last of the women to be released in 2013 after having served six and a half, seven and a half years in prison. So that, that is the conclusion to the story, and I think it does kind of speak to, you know, sort of the, the importance, the kind of necessity of collaborative action and storytelling, particularly from a feminist perspective. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. That was um, great, and thank you for for having me. My name is uh, my name is JP Gritton, and I'm also uh, an assistant professor uh, in the English department at Duke. Um, so I, I'm going to be interesting, or I probably won't be interesting, but I um, <laughs> I'm going to be introducing um, Titi Ajaji. Um, watching Titi Ajaji read from her poetry feels a little like being invited to step into someone's living room. Maybe that's partly because when I saw her read at the regulator a couple weeks ago, her parents were in the audience. Um, but maybe it's also because Titi reads in the spirit of a gracious host, uh, somebody who invites her friends in to sit, to listen, and to be heard in turn. It's fitting that a home is nothing if not the place in which kinship gets defined Mother Tongues, her second full collection of poetry, weds language to family, enacts family in language. In Mother Tongue, a daughter's bush-born vernacular follows this proven logic, with mother speak mommy's talk, otherwise be at home in words. Maybe as she is the same daughter who writes, we are the darker sister, claiming blood bonds with Hughes, who claimed the same thing from Whitman, when he invited him inside his poem. I guess it's fitting, or else just flattering, that when she signed my copy, Tsitsi made it out to JP, my brother in arms. 
Tsitsi Judge is an associate professor of English at Duke University with expertise in African and Amer African American literary and cultural studies with special interests in music, poetry, and black feminisms. She previously taught at the University of Pennsylvania and has received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities, Schomburg Center, Mellon Foundation, Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies, and the National Humanities Center. In addition to outstanding achievements as a scholar, Jaji is the author of two collections of poetry. Beating the Graves was published through the African Poetry Book Fund with University of Nebraska Press, and her chapbook, Carnaval, appears in New Generation African Poets box set. Her poems have appeared in Black Renaissance Noir, pra Prairie Schooner, Bitter Orleander, Illuminations, Madison Review, 1111, and elsewhere. The night's reading comes after appearances at the Poetry Foundation, Library of Congress, and the United Nations, among other venues. Please welcome our sister in arms, C.T. Judgey. Um, thank you, JP, for that beautiful introduction. Thank you to Jasmine, to Sarah, to Ranji, to um, all of the stewards of um, Meridians, um, to Mecca, to all of you. Um, this is very special. Um, and thank you to JP, who is um, one of my newest colleagues in the English department and a fiction writer. Um, and uh, yeah, helped me think about what I do better than I do myself in some ways. So I want to follow um, the lead of Miriam and others today in um, beginning by going back to my grandmother um, and then obviously there's a lot of thinking about mothering in this po uh, poem collection. Um, I grew up in Zimbabwe, and in Zimbabwe every uh, family, uh, autochthonous family, I guess, uh, has a, um, a totem and a clan, um, and those are passed on patrilineally. Um, so one claims one's father's clan and is claimed by um, uh, the, the patrilineage. Uh, and it occurred to me some time ago that, hey, if I'm a feminist, why <laughs> am I just a zebra on my father's side and not a lion on my uh, grandmother's side? And um, so somewhat speciously, I decided that um, since one of the reasons uh, totems that are animals are so powerful, besides encoding an ethical relationship to the environment, and in light of Mecca's amazing story, also um, insisting on a, um, a whole and wholesome relation uh, between our humanity and our, um, and our animality, I think. Um, those, the technique of the totem seems brilliant to me because you're always seeing signs of your ancestry. Um, as a zebra woman, when I see a bee, um, or guinea fowl, which I generally don't see, but if I find a picture of one, I'm like, hey, you know, I, I am reminded that I come from people. And I think that's a technology in a number of societies that have totems that's really smart. Like, you have these signposts everywhere. And so, since I don't live in a situation where I would care to run into a lion, um, the closest great cat in my life is my kitty, <laughs> uh, Zarina. And so I wrote this poem in all seriousness for my grandmother, Ambuya Jaji, and her totem, Shumba Nyamziwa, which is lion you will know <laughs> when <laughs> you're in its presence. Um, and uh, in gratitude for the comfort of a cat, particularly during a difficult pregnancy. All pregnancies are difficult, <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> Anyways, <clears throat> in praise of the great cat, today I have come begging wisdom of the cat. Cowed by messages my body leaves in code, it is her flex I crave to ease the arduous distance between arch and heel. Beneath her, I feel a hum alongside the pump of heart unhurried, except in sympathy with mine. 
Her eyes, banks of pooled sunlight, look into mine. She asks nothing. She is all here. I have never seen her lips, but her tongue unsmooths my hair, forgives my disarray, stretches all. Oh, spirit of my grandmother, friend of my youngest self, come to me in each body you have chosen. You have stayed by me, quickened calm, then sprung away. Um, another way that I've been thinking about mothers is as a daughter who tries to walk alongside um, my own mother, who in her 80s is uh, experiencing um, dementia. And I think that kin work that women do in multiple directions, um, sometimes to our biological relations and sometimes to those who have mothered us along the way, fathered us, uncled us, etc. Um, that's a, a, a kind of uh, problematic and challenge, I think, to the ways that we think about intersectionality that many people have done lots of work on, kin work, et cetera, et cetera, but that I'm noticing differently and, and being challenged to think about age as one of those kinds of intersectionalities that we can think more about. So this poem is about really the, the difficulty of having to be hard that kind of caretaker who's hard. <clears throat> and they didn't die. That's the title of a, a novel by Loretta and Kobo, who um, I got to read at Oberlin, not quite Smith, but I have similar feelings about my teachers there. And it was Ama Ateidu who assigned that. <clears throat> and they didn't die. For my mother, who has done all things well. I bring a squall of quiet, my hectoring force, to shame the belated fog of orders and bandages into a fine mist. I am here to squelch reason's panic. Certainty is scrambled and we find only Vaseline thick with scent and too heavy to churn the waters. If they wept no tears, they would not know I will not shed any. If there were no tremors, they would not know me, unshaken. I will outlive them. I will bury them in my question. What more? This is what we have done since before the border between wild and free was pinned like steel and plaster, animal and woman, birth and death. Only daughters are shouldered into becoming mother, cold without children, colder still after birth. This is how it has always been. All we cannot know is when. I found myself thinking a lot about photography in um, this uh, collection, not intentionally, it's sort of one of those things when I was trying to assemble something that looked like a whole, I was like, huh, there are a lot of those. Um, this is a, a poem uh, in honor of Malik Sidibe, wonderful Malian photographer. Um, I was so grateful to have one of his images on the cover of my first book. And a friend took that book and handed it to Malik Sidibe in Bamako and took a picture of him receiving this. And it meant a lot to him, you know? <laughs> so, Malik Sidibe's camera calls. Come to me, all you ochred yellows and you swaths of indigo bled purple. You too poor for boo-boos and you cotton blenders. Clutch your full skirts, young women, or smooth the curves of your taibas. The negative will drain whatever brassy print your tailor settled on and wash your sun skin bright. 
The darker the room, the groovier the glint of a flirting eye, a glossed nail, a lavish twist done just right. Night time is the right time to be young, gifted, and black, to mash, grind, funk up the checkered floor, and shake all living color off for the silvery surface of infinity. Hang here after the shoot, if you wish. The beat goes on. I guess it wasn't just photography, it was art, you know, I guess you have to think of something to write about when you're a poet, and <laughs> um, this is a, a, a sculpture by the British um, sculptor. I, I know nothing about her except that she made this sculpture and, sculpture, and I saw it as a Benin bronze. Our face is one thick guild. Old metal screens our here. Our now reflects your now. An oily light besmears us all. Live matter slicks our temples. We are sheened. We take umbrage, bronze it. We, this brazen block. Night flares to light our way and sear our nostrils, unthrown. We chase our golden blinkered lover. Justice stares as if to meet our purple gaze. Clavicle to clavicle, we shall overcome this day. Um. I was living in Cambridge when uh, the, the Boston bombing, uh, well, the marathon that attack uh, took place. Um, it was a very disturbing experience. Um, of course, I wouldn't minimize the loss of the, the um, five or so families who lost a member of their family, but the, the response was astonishing in terms of the theater of the state. I remember watching... Um, on TV as actual army tanks drove down the actual streets of Watertown hunting for these terrorists, as um, we were made certain to know from a lockdown that you had to stay indoors <laughs> in Somerville, Massachusetts for hours. Um, and it got me thinking about who buried uh, those um, uh, the, 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 the sun, um, and uh, about body counts. The body counts. The body count at Lockerbie. The body count in the London bombing. The body count at Tiananmen Square. The body count at Sharpville. Then Soweto. The body count in Chicago on any given day the body count in New Orleans on that particular day. The body count in West Texas or in Boston, burying Tamerlan's body counts against the undertaker from Virginia. The body count at dawn in Waziristan that very same week. The body count at an Afghan wedding, collateral. The body counts to the mother cradling her blood-stained daughter just born. The body counts to the mother cradling her blood-stained daughter just dead. The body count here in Philadelphia, city of brotherly love under rubble, north, west. The body count by classroom, children caned to death over Bocasa's school uniforms. The body counts in garment factories, in strawberry fields, in the mines. The body count at Jonestown that matched the cool age cup count. The body count at Little Big Horn and then at Wounded Knee. The body count according to Ida B. Wells, sweet Jesus. 
the body count according to the Khmer Rouge. The body count not including Habayarimana, the body counts not mentioned, the body count at Gettysburg, the body counts before, on board, over, then below. The body counts to Eleanor, visiting Emile's grave four birthdays since. She brings him flowers and a blanket embroidered with a periodic table to warm his grave. She tends the land that hugs him as if it were her own broken body. Um, I'm so glad that JP and Misha introduced um, us and that we heard from Miriam about her creative writing and to be here with Mecca because um, we never write alone, right? Um, and you, everybody knows that. Scholarly writers know that because we have like these pages long bibliographies. <laughs> Anyways, how I write. This is for Ren R. Ellis Neira poet. Now I see that my wilderness is our field, and I call my neighbor to come plow it with me. Our hoes dig deep. Our harvest spills over into something an awful lot like hope. Uh, since Langston Hughes came up, uh, I want to read a poem that I wrote after being astonished to be sitting at um, a, a, how to put it, a not so pro black space <laughs> um, where there had been many uh, very elevated talks over the course of the time that we were all there. Um, and this person, um, I assumed, would simply be in the tradition of the not especially pro-black erudition that had become the genre we were all treated to. Um, and yet she surprised me. She uh, was a linguist. And so I call this auxiliary for Angelica Kratzer, linguist. And this is what she began her talk with somehow as an illustration. While it is not absolutely impossible, it is nevertheless quite unlikely that nature could construct an angel from an extant phylogeny. The back of a mammal has no pre-existing structures that could be stretched or shrunk, folded or bent into a wing. These, then, are the concerns of the semanticists and their rival siblings, the syntacticians. They worry about how to swan song a boat. More precisely, they start with a boat. Take a boat in Boston, for example. Say, something like swan boat. But they do not suppose we all know what that is. Is it a swan boat or a swan boat? They might quibble. Then they really get going. They suggest a swan boat book and we twitter with erudite delight. They keep a straight face. Well then, what about a swan boat book award? And our snobbery is further excited. Why, what would the award ceremony look like? What would we wear? Would we perhaps break with our own traditions and wear a dress? Would we wear a pantsuit? But who besides a Swan Boat Book awardee wears a pantsuit these days? The striding syntactician has a twinkle in her high eye. Her angelic powers may be diminutive, but her impishness is palpable. And for reasons known only to her, she honors each of uh, our traditions. Invoking Langston, she wins us over completely. This, then, is our best effort at last, our opening closer, a cooperative interaction, we hope, in the spirit of such. We present our sister semanticist, or 
was she the syntactician with this salute, a swan song, after all? We hope it suits. Uh, what to do, what to do. Um, uh, I like to invite all sorts of people who have earned the, the um, qualification to join the Zebra Sisterhood. This is how it's done. Procedure for initiation into the Zebra Sisterhood. Try to avoid the fool who mistakes a zebra for a pack mule. That fool is probably a jackass. Get too close and you may get a kick in your nuts. So grow a pair and join the tribe. How long have I been going? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, we'll, we'll go back to uh, a couple more tender ones. Um, <clears throat> I, I was raised in uh, the church, in the Christian tradition, and so uh, scriptural stuff makes its way into uh, my writing. Um, I think my relation to that stuff is sort of like Lucille Clifton. Um, at one point, somebody called her a Christian writer, and she was like, I think I would know if I was a Christian writer. <laughs> so in any case, our mother of stone... The cushion of her flesh is veiled in lichen. Where her breasts once gave way, she is rough to the touch. Crowned with a pot of water, her eyes drop dead at the tail of the double-chinned lizard. Queen of heaven, she aches for nothing now. She props the absolute's illusionist upon her hardened lap. Her chin quivers, her belly too, recalling this wild fruit's flight. Clouds of sulfur pass for seraphim. Heaven greens over like the beady eye of a magnate tracking sooty children who flee his coins. Every frontier is blocked. So Our Lady lifts the runaways into her tender chokehold. The rich fume, empty-handed, swindled of thread, and those cheap, nimble little fingers. I'm going to read three more. This one um, was inspired by an article in the New York Times. Um, you'll understand the types of, of articles this would have been. At the time, uh, the people on this island were among uh, the minority of uh, European spaces that were welcoming uh, Syrian refugees. Um, since then, that isn't necessarily the case there either, but maybe this poem, in retrospect, helps me think about how that shift might happen to me. On the Isle of Lesbos, for the ones who welcomed refugees on the Aegean shores. Months later, the island's sheep shuffle, uneasy with silence. Last year, a hundred thousand voices begged to be buried here, not in Aleppo. They wretched as if heaving could save them but only thick seas of salt spilled onto the holiday sand. Now an island man clenches his jaw. The earth holds his only daughter still. One Christmas, spasms seized her. The next, her brother shook his way to lay down beside her body below. Then this fishing man learned what grave diggers already know by doing. Only the boat's lip remained, trembling on a crest of sympathy. He moored himself in his nest, nets, a morning hall of squid mimed hope. Then the tide turned. 
his arms flooded full of other men's children, come to rescue him from an unfathomed ocean of grief. Mothers, mothers were caught off guard. They shepherded this off-season crowd to the guest houses, fed them ewes' milk, took care to pay their stumps no mind. These sibyls already knew, from Turk, from Greek, how opposites can hurl their waves of rage at no man's land and turn men and women to ruins. If they had it to do over again, they would and could, now that their villages have cleared, now that the boy's photograph has won its Pulitzer and slipped our minds. They feel washed out, they feel their memories ebb, their faint, faded, safic rags must have been drowned out by Madeira's sirens and Ibiza's disco scene. Once a day, a woman sights a tiny ghost toddling across the water. All that these islanders have earned is anxious rest. Not even saints stranded at home can live without bread to kiss and milk to rinse it from their lips. So the book is called Mother Tongues, and the first poem is called Mother Tongue. And in many ways, it's a confession about uh, why it is that I write in English. And um, that is because although I uh, started off my life speaking Shona, um, uh, except to my mother who's from Ohio, as you will hear again in the story. Um, uh, I spent a couple months in the U.S. when I was very young, and uh, English became my dominant language. And so the guilt that I feel over that loss, especially in the framework that we think of ourselves as, you know, involved in revolutionary struggles and, you know, um, all that sort of thing is, I think, part of my language hunger and it's part of this story that uh, is important for clearing my throat in a certain way. Mother tongue. Mother of two, mixed and matched Ohio blonde, brings her brown babies, born to a brand new nation, home alone. Cash strapped, Father of two stays behind, husbanding their shared hearth. She tames the airbound toddler boy on an elastic leash. In the airport, an unknown wasp waist girly woman squawks in alarm her blessedly untested parental principles. <laughs> I have a toddler. <laughs> I did not have a toddler when I wrote this. Uh, sometimes poetry is prophetic. Uh, when boy won't budge, his corduroy seat sails across the waxed floors while sister does dragging duty, a trail of gleam in their wake. That sister's bush-born vernacular follows this proven logic. With mother speak mommy's talk, otherwise be at home in words. Fatherless for a spell, her tale of ups and downs and pressure and vomit in a paper bag wells up at the sight of the first matching man. Black is beautiful, powered by pride, wounded with each stop, blunted by each frisk. Black is the color of our first true love, Baba, warm heart, beating to calm colic, nightmares, and memories flicker of something history will call chimurenga. The language of home spills off daughter's tongue, drowning this unknown umber man whose skin is a flag of peace. His face laughs, bewilders, then unsettles in dread. White woman panic will bring only trouble, he harbors no desire for the body of this bronze girl child, no bribe, no candy, no white van out back. Suddenly he sees they look like family, 
yet he can cite no ocean to wash them apart. Mother knows best, so sorry, mother knows best. She clasps small brown hand in hers and smooths golden head of spiral hair with a free hand. She spells out a new code. Everyone here speaks only mother's tongue. Now, sister does too. End of story. And the last one, I don't know, JP must have had my playlist or something. <laughs> it's called, We Are the Darker Sister. Oh God, who saw fit to print me long after silver's gelatin age, you have etched us in cursive cipher. Lived in negative, we exalt its secret revelations, a hairpin fracture spinning light through wounded bone, the cry of that cryptic wilderness, the body. O oh, you whose wisdom is taken for hysteria in the measured mind, who, why did you give the scramblers pens and us this flash of song and lightning's tale too soon muted in memory's churn? How are we to spell this velvet touch of ours, sun-burnished mother? Thanks. Um, thank you both so much. Um, I have a question for Mecca, actually. Um, I was just wondering if you often write stories about true events or stories from an archive, and if so, can you say a little more about your practice around that? Yeah, that's a really good question. I am inclined to say no, but I think that my collection tells a different story, actually, you know? Um, and especially, I mean, truth, you know, sort of true and real events, there is, those are interesting kind of capacious categories. So I, I should say yes. I guess I do often um, draw from, you know, sort of lived experience, my own and those of others. This story, so I have two stories that are sort of clearly um, drawn from the stories of other people who have lived, and it's a it's a challenge, you know. Um, in the case of Wolfpack, I, as I said, I you know sort of was clear that there was a part of the story that I thought was very important that had not been circulating in the narrative. Right again, back to the history versus the story. I saw the, these instances of linguistic violence in the history as it was unfolding, but it was completely absented from the story. And so I felt that I had something to kind of contribute. Um, there was something I felt that I needed to say, and that was my, the, my kind of push to the page. And so when I teach, I teach both literary studies and creative writing, and when I talk to writing students about this, it's the best I can do in terms of explaining again, how I justify sort of what might otherwise be read as the telling of someone else's story. Um, I also had the chance to meet uh, Patrice Johnson after she was released from prison and she had read the story and it was really, again, gratifying, um, humbling to hear that she found some value in the story. And so that helped me to kind of feel like that was, you know, there was a, the story had sort of gone in a productive direction. But it's a hard thing. I think historical fiction is a little bit different because, you know, sort of we're not talking about lives that are ongoing and sort of, you know, experiences that are being had at the current moment. So the other story that is sort of clearly historical is a short story of mine called The Strange People, which is about Millie and Christine McCoy, um, conjoined twins born into slavery who then sort of hit the performer circuit. And so I you know, was very interested in, as Misha said, I'm interested in weird bodies and bodies that sort of do different things and defy norms and their bodies you know, certainly inspired me. Um, and so I pulled from, from their story. I felt a little bit less conflicted about that because they're not around. So does that answer your question? Could you speak a little bit about the two worlds that you are living in as creative writers and scholar academics? <laughs> In some ways, I forget who asked the question, but during the, um, the invocation we were doing with um, Alex, it's mm -hmm. about how do, we, how do we bridge these two worlds, mm -hmm. which I know Meridians tries to do, but could you say a little bit about that experience for yourselves? Uh, thanks for asking. I, um, 
I think in general with everything we're doing, we're always just trying our best to muddle through stuff, you know. Um, but uh, I kind of feel like I, I am me wherever I go. It's not like I can sort of check the poet at the coat rack and then bring the scholar to class and that sort of thing. Um, uh, but we live in these institutional structures that track these things and track labor and track value in very, very sharp ways and assign um, monetary value or prestige in very different ways in all of those. So um, I would say that for a long time I've thought of my scholarship as, um, you know, my paycheck work. <laughs> Uh, I guess that's true of poets in particular. <laughs> like, there are no royalties. Uh, you are the royalty who have come to listen, you know. But, uh, um, and that, I guess that's how poetry for me happens, is I sort of trip into a word like, you are the royalty, you know. It's um, so the part of my mind that is most clear when improvising which, to be honest, on some level is at a different place in the relation to safety than my scholarship is. Um, Alexis did this amazing thing earlier today. Um, those of you who um, weren't here, I can try to, to recount it, where she would invite us to think about a person and a question and a number. And then she asked us if you were thinking of numbers. She opened up this uh, wonderful book, Dub, in which she has done her own very creative, critical reflections and read whatever the number was. And it hit. And my number was 42, which um, uh, is a... Uh, there's some highway book where it's supposed to be the meaning of life. I've never read the book, but <laughs> it says 42 is the meaning of life. So I'm like, okay, 42. And the, the thing was frontiers. And the line I remember, Alexis's line that comes out of her thinking creatively with Sylvia Winter, who was a creative writer, playwright, etc., but we think of her strictly as a theorist, um, was that the edge of the world is not the end of the world. And I find that I feel, and I think we all feel in some way at risk some of the time, but those of us who recognize the project of transnational feminism as a liberation project understand that in particularly sharp ways, that in those places, improvisatory thinking maybe comes from a deep place of remembering fleeing fugitivity, like thinking quickly on your feet, figuring out how to be okay, how to get out of the way, how to find subterfuge. And so those poems come at work as well. <laughs> um, but uh, the scholarly process is one that feels so likely to be graded, even in, you know, post-tenure world, um, in a way that poetry can be deemed, you know, maudlin or boring or whatever, but it's somehow, it's a different thing. And so I find that scholarly writing is very, very scary to begin. And poetry is very scary to finish, but it's the beginning, the have you read enough? Have, do you, can you figure out a hook that's serious, takes enough of a fresh, et cetera, et cetera? Um, so pretty much I just take a break from the one to do the other. I find that I need a poem to kind of process something and then uh, move from it. And the scholarly stuff, I mean, I enjoy it. I'm nosy, I'm curious, and so I like reading, you know, and archives and all that. Um, but uh, somehow it's not in the moment that it's in touch with risk. And it's not necessarily for me one a relationship of intellectual property, but I think that this gathering will help me to remember that it's never about our name on the cover. It is our labor, of course, et cetera, but that we are laboring in a great company of fellow strugglers, 
visionaries, um, proposers of something else that could be possible. And so, yeah, we never write alone. And we never write just for our tenure review committees, et cetera. So there's a long, long answer. And Mecca probably has a much more interesting one. No, no, no. no. no I, it's, it's really interesting to hear you know, your perspective on this. I think all I would add is that I like that you how you sort of have gone to risk as a way of thinking through this question. Because I think for me, it has felt risky at times. Um, and yet, you know, as Audre Lorde says, when I use my voice in the service of my vision, it becomes less important whether I'm afraid, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it also helps for me to think about lineage, right? I mean, Sylvia Winter, this is why every time I sort of bring a creative voice into a space that includes a lot of brilliant theorists and scholars, I feel like I need to reference Barbara Christian. And, you know, again, Audre Lorde, Gloria Salua, June Jordan, Leslie Mormon Silko, all of these women of color feminists who have, in fact, been writing on both sides of the institutional and maybe somewhat arbitrary theoretical versus creative or aesthetic versus political divide, right? That, like, the, these divides, as you said, I think are institutional and don't necessarily speak to what motivates us to explore our lives in language. Um, but and for me, the risk comes in sort of you know, again, feeling the fear and doing it anyway, right? Mm -hmm. Sort of recognizing. And I think it's because I started very early in my career at Smith, in fact. I was a Mellon fellow. And I remember the moment when my Mellon advisor sort of discovered that I was writing plays on the side. And I, I didn't know that it was something to speak of because I sort of was like, I'm doing both of these things and they both matter to me. And it, that was a, a kind of moment of shock and realizing, okay, there's not necessarily an institutional language for this identity that I want to occupy, but I don't have a choice, you know, so I'll continue to do that. I mean, similar things at Penn where, you know, I'm sort of working on my dissertation and doing fiction readings. And, you know, I, I joke that it was the only thing that I've ever been closeted about in my life was being a fiction writer. Because there were some moments where I was like, I'm not going to talk about this publication today, you know. And I think at, at this point in my career, you know, cats out the bag. And I feel great about that. Thank you for that question. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question for Professor Jaji. Um, so you've you've talked in your poems. You've talked about prominent African figures like Malik Sidibe, and you've mentioned um, African. You've made cultural references, um, and you've also talked about your choice to write in English um, instead of Shona. So I have like two questions. So the first question is, as an African living in the diaspora, do you feel when you're, when you're working, do you feel like in a sense you're torn between two worlds? And if so, how do you deal with that? Um, and the second question, um, the choice, many, many prominent, a number of prominent African authors have chosen to go in the opposite direction. People like Ngugi wa Thiongo who decided to write in Kikuyu instead of like English. Um, so criticisms Chinua Achebe faced for writing in English. So I was wondering if you've ever considered at least having some of your works in Shona or if it's something you have had to deal with. Thank you. Ernest is taking a class I'm really enjoying teaching called What is Africa to Me? And um, we've had great conversations. I see Camille is here too. And this is something we could probably continue in class. Um, and so yes, of course, my Kenyan a uh, student will cite Ngugi wa Tiongo, <laughs> as we all should, um, uh, especially when rooting for him for the Nobel Prize before it's too late. Um, do I feel torn? I have at times because, you know, one way that I, I identify myself in my work is that I say I am a African-American scholar and African poet. And that's partially because that's the formation that I've had. Um, I uh, did all my tertiary education in the US um, and three years of my childhood as well. So uh, the methodologies, the stakes, the tradition, the lineage of African American studies is very, very important to me and how I think, you know. Um, and so that's kind of the way that lineage um, figures for me which in an essentialist kind of way might actually be 
aligned to this African worldview that I was talking about in terms of a totemic understanding of oneself, right? Um, I found that metaphor rather than literal uses of language as languages, you know, um, has helped me to come to terms with the fact that um, if I write in Shona, I have one poem <laughs> that I've written in Shona, um, it will be poor Shona. Uh, it will be the Shona of four-year-old um, uh, who then attended schools that were barely decolonized and in fact weren't, um, where it mattered what grade you got in French, it mattered what grade you got in German, we had to take those for O-levels, um, and people were surprised if at your second year exam, so halfway through to the O-levels, um, you got a passing grade in Shona, it was never mentioned after that. So that's the kind of school I went to. Um, so I, I'm it, functionally illiterate in Shona. Right. Um, I think I'm probably somewhat of a minority in my generation in that way. I certainly hope that I am. But I've heard people say that this is not just the case for people who have one parent who is not a Shona speaker um, uh, and uh, whose home language is essentially English. Right. So, um, yeah, I wish it were different. Yes, at times I felt very tortured. That's why I use this word guilt about that. Um, but at the same time, I want to recognize how fortunate I am as a black person in the world to have this kind of intimate knowledge of a lineage, a language, a culture that, um, in which I can think um, of my history, right? So Vanyemba, uh, my ancestral kind of founding figure, um, who, by the way, um, was a, a kind of third sex individual. Um, probably some people today would use the language of trans. I don't think that um, they would have thought of themselves that way because it wasn't the language of the moment. But it does contradict, say, another traditionalist version of lineage in terms of uh, uh, Mugabe claiming that this was a um, uh, queerness was this import from uh, from the North. Um, but to try and stay on point for what you're asking, um, I, I have to work with what I've got. And so that one poem was bilingual. I published it once online in Jalada, which I think is actually published out of uh, Kenya, or was at one point, um, with my bad Shona alongside my poetic English. And I said, I'm putting this out there because this is the document documentation of my relation to these languages. That is a, a, a work, a work of art. Um, but then I also decided in the book version, in Beating the Greys, I don't speak Shona, but I'm in a family <laughs> where people do. This is a conversation I don't, I haven't had with my father because it's a difficult conversation, but we sit down, we have that conversation. I read him a line in English that's in praise of this ancestor figure of ours, and um, then he corrects my Shona version. We sat there for a couple of hours, um, and he, who had a PhD, but in the typical immigrant story of coming to the US and winding up like a janitor, um, for a moment, understood that his PhD daughter as well, who he was very proud of, wanted and needed to learn something from him about our history that has been denigrated by pretty much all frames of, of official epistemologies, right? So, um, yes, Ngugi has written in Kikuyu. He writes the thick, thick book version in Kikuyu, and then he writes his own translation. It's a little bit shorter, and we wonder, well, what the hell happened in those other 200 pages, right? Um, but. Not everybody is doing that, and I hate to say it, but the book market for books in Kikuyu is not as lucrative as the book market in English, right? So you have a smaller audience, et cetera. I think, I feel happy and, and um, hopeful about those people who are writing in African languages. And um, Zimbabwe, for example, is lucky enough that the, the colonial borders found such a way that a large chunk of Zimbabwe speak Shona and the, another large chunk speak Ndebele. So we actually have a long history of local language publication and a market for it and, and textbook series and all that kind of thing. So, so it's there and it's okay in a certain kind of way, but I share 
this concern with the precarity of language and the endangeredness of language, um, we are losing every day languages. Like every day languages are no longer spoken. So those people who can preserve them in text, I'm grateful for them and I'm, I am aware of the dynamism of my relation to language and the fact that I can't do, do that. So I do this. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mecca and Titi, for uh, speaking for myself, but I think for many of us, for taking us inside the words and the feelings of the ideas we've talked about today. This was such a perfect end to our first day. Thank you all for sticking around and please join us for dinner outside and please return in the morning for more of our symposium starting at nine, nine, yes. So thank you all, thank you. I want a picture with you.